Harry and I met in Stockholm in 2018 when we were both performing at an event. I was struck by his awesome talent for creativity, technology and strategy, even back then. He's been experimenting with voice augmentation and machine learning for around six years at least. This year, he's made headlines working with AI and the Leipzig Ballet at the same time. So, the performance you're about to see is not just somebody who is insanely good at beatboxing. Everything you're going to hear has been enhanced and inspired by machines. He's going to talk about all of that afterwards, by the way, but for now, it's time to enjoy the performance. Everybody live at the Cog X Festival here in the magnificent O2 Arena. Please welcome the inimitable, the amazing Harry Yef, also known as Reaps 100. So, in this very unique setting, um, my name is Harry Yef. Uh, it's an honor to share a closing session, not just focusing on technical proficiency, but going beyond uh, my roots in voice and performance. The last six years, I've been very blessed that my ideas, concepts, research around voice move beyond a musical context and we found something. We found that the theme of voice paired with innovation is a very unique opportunity. When you start to direct and explore emerging tech rooted in the concept of voice, it becomes embodied. It becomes present. So I founded a company six years ago, which is to explore what is the possible expansions of creativ creativity, voice, and exploration? We started to build experiences around voice, designing large-scale sculpture, dome projection, spatial audio, and eventually five years of non-stop research and experimentation into new narratives around machine learning. We were really fascinated that when you start to tell stories with emerging tech, we start to reach new voices and new minds. I think this is one challenge that we face in the space of innovation. There are specific cultures and disciplines that up until now have had a very specific access. But my personal narrative as an artist, I am neurodivergent, I am from a working class background, and my introduction to some of the philosophies in why we should embrace AI from different cultures, different disciplines, different classes, actually started when I was 14. So my beginnings was in tournament chess. And this uh, fierce face of a 14-year-old boy 
came from a very different background to my chess uh, opponents. I could not travel like they could. I didn't have the same resource. And it was that Christmas that I received a chess engine from my father. This chess engine never got tired of play. I was able to develop an intimate, non-stop relationship with a discipline, with a skill. And it's this unrelenting support that smart systems offer to every single expertise on earth. So as I mentioned, my very hyper-specialism may be voice, but what we're seeing is an emergence of expertise 2.0 where any skill set, any individual can develop a data set and develop what I call a second self, an agent of support that never relents and that is always there. And the more accessible these tools become, new stories emerge, new ways of connecting. And it's fascinating that in game theory, it's very established that human play is augmented. If you view a world-class chess match, you're observing an augmented intelligence. A human being that may not be fully present with an engine or a system, but thousands of hours of research and investigation by using smart systems to improve human play. So in the realms of art, I'm very interested in the stories and designing projects that allow us to introduce new narratives and in turn reach new demographics and new people. Applying this discomfort of chess, the fact that an opponent can push back, an opponent can be your greatest collaborator, I started to apply this to emerging tech and the projects that we designed. And what you actually see above me is a musical instrument. This is called the Polyphonic Playground and it has 56 triggers and a musician, an expert musician, would come along, they would plug 56 sounds from their DAO, and an algorithm would spread them randomly across the structure. The reason I share this is I think discomfort is a key part of immersion and augmentation. When we work with new technology, there can be such an aversion to be challenged and to do things in new ways. But when a musician, was faced with this challenge, who normally stands a certain way, thinks a certain way, breathes a certain way, they now had to reach and jump. Introduce 500 viewers into that room, what you have is a terrified musician. But it's in that wholesome fear, a new per perspective can emerge. It's in play and discomfort, new things can happen. So when I approach my work with artificial intelligence, I see it in three key categories. I think there is opposition, collaboration, and mentorship. When it comes to discomfort in my own voice, this was a clip generated with DataBots uh, about two years ago. And as hum a human being who has a voice of a certain lexicon, spending 30,000 hours developing my techniques, traveling around the world, thinking about the potential of the human voice, it was only when I started working with machines that I actually felt truly uncomfortable in a creative way. Every human being in this room has a unique voice. This is something that normally can't be replicated or met. Meeting something is both you and not you. CJ Carr encouraged me in my time at Harvard to effectively create a huge data set of voice. And we started to generate clips like this. She sees so I started to design that, and this uh, is me, and um, they um, are more the nice, and I formed so this is and so this is this is um, them, well, and they're like, so, so that, uh, this, and this are not. And this was a very uncomfortable feeling to hear my voice, this individual who spent their whole life thinking about phrases, who has had complete control of their hyperspecialism for the first time hearing something new speak back to me. And it was in this moment I realized that I had spent my whole life trying to sound like a machine, and now these systems in some way were trying to sound like me. And it's in this mirror image, I think there is a biting point of augmented intelligence where these systems become an intelligence flashlight. 
you are able to see further, stand on the shoulders of your discipline, which is very established in game theory, in chess and go, but what is that event horizon when culture and expertise holistically starts to embrace this opposition, embrace this discomfort? So in 2019, I was brought to Bell Labs in, as an EAT artist to explore this theme. I was invited to the room where sound goes to die, one of the world's earliest anechoic chambers. And you can see one of my idols here, John Cage, experimenting and writing. When I entered that room, with Bell Labs, we had a conversation. What would be an artwork, a piece, where I can generate not just voice, but new lexicons of phraseologies? What would be a story that we could tell to show the world, which shows a world-class expert in something very hyper-specialized, embracing the second self, embracing that opposition and that discomfort. So it was in this room that I pushed myself and we started to have these rehearsals of musical digital twin phrase chess. The clip you're about to see is a showcase of the types of practicing and interactions with now not just spoken word, but vocal phrases, drums and sounds. And it's in this, I just want you to listen to the dance between the human and the machine. So what I found so fascinating is when we started to generate new phrases using these systems, again, hearing things that I'd never heard before, but I couldn't keep up. It was a ghost that was 10 steps ahead of me. And I could have moved away. I could have let that discomfort affect my ego or affect my previous experience. But what did I do? I lent in. And over the past four years, I've spent over a hundred hours training with these phraseologies. In my very hyper-specialism, where there's only one of me, I've been able to break through glass ceilings. This discussion of opposition, opposition can be your greatest collaboration. But the key word on how we can harmonize and narrative, there was an experience I had in New York, spending a huge amount of time visualizing voice. What are systems that can visualize voice and develop a new form of augmentation? And I want to keep repeating this term of augmented intelligence. What does true augmentation mean? We had a system that would respond to the human voice. You would walk up and you would speak. And algorithmically, the color and the form of 200,000 particles would generate a unique data point for you. These 500 individuals who waited, there was one person there who completely changed my perspective on the function of art, tech, and my personal purpose in this whole demographic, this whole space, this whole system, which was a very young girl who was extremely shy, who held onto her father's leg like a koala bear. She did not want to speak to anybody else, but she quietly waited her turn. And as she finally arrived at the microphone, she started to speak. And when she did these tiny, tiny sounds, she saw her voice start to emerge as a two-story projection. And her tiny sounds eventually became screams and shouts and laughter. And it was in that moment I saw the power of technology as something that can help someone flower. When you have this feedback loop, you're able to collaborate and see things in a new way. There are new stories, but there is also new ceremony. And I think this is, as a storyteller, this is extremely important and exciting that these systems that are seen with bias and that are seen as cold and digital 
actually have the potential to have a well-being, self-development, and even sometimes a spiritual quality. So that experience led to one of my latest projects with Chong Bao, who's my collaborator, which is Voice Gems. And Voice Gems is a 200,000 particle system that generates digital gemstones based on an individual's voice. And over the past three years, we have been collecting voices from all over the world to generate these structures. And we call this the thousand year archive. And what we were surprised by, that when we started to get our first bits of global attention, we received hundreds of emails from people that had lost loved ones, looking to take their cold storage, these precious bits of data that they had on a mobile device uh, of someone that is no longer here, and place it into a digital artifact. Many of these people with no digital background, but it was the narrative and the story allowed them to feel accessible connection to the emerging tech. So the clip I want to play you, despite us collecting pieces from Jane Goodall and Ai Weiwei, this is actually one of my favorite pieces, and it's very simple. It's a conversation between a father and a daughter, and we isolated the daughter's voice, and I just want you to listen for a moment. Tell me your name. What's your name? Percy. Where did you go today? Um, to the zoo. You went to the zoo? Yeah. You went in the Wawa? Yeah. What, else, what animals did you see? A uh, penguin. A penguin? Yeah. So the system has taken the features in her voice and the same recording twice would generate the same work. And we have frozen what is normally seen as a moment that comes and go in time. Voice has a smoke-like quality. But what's so fascinating is her voice has changed. This was created a year ago, and every two years we're going to produce a new work. So as we collect these pieces, new stories emerge. What you're seeing here is not a digital render. This is a voice-generated aluminum mineral crystalline form. This is a physical piece. And we've now replaced 12 diamond engagement rings with voice-generated works that have come from laughter between lovers. So it's in storytelling that real change can happen. And I think the world is starting to embrace. And the final section of this story, which is about mentorship, last year, I was commissioned by Leipzig Opera House uh, to creative direct an international ballet work to incorporate and bring emerging tech into a very conservative 17th century opera house. And it was here I was able to bring early APIs, early versions of ChatGPT, MidJourney, and sample RNN to generate not just the music, but work with the set designer, the choreographer, to sit down and generate the script. And long before the current emergence of this tech, we were able to introduce a workflow as a prediction that everyone can be mentored by these systems to create generative images that eventually become large-scale physical set pieces this is what is fascinating in the discomfort in the openness to be able to generate from 35 ballet dancers a whole range of new entities to fuse so my main message is that we can do more with these tools and the question is, why do people not? They feel a sense of automation and replacement. And I think there is, when it comes to consent and understanding what's gonna happen, there are many questions. But I really think these narratives of fear, when you embrace awe, beauty, and wonder as a way to reach new people, minorities, new demographics, you can turn new heads and you change narratives of fear to narratives of hope. Thank you. So I'd just like to reintroduce uh, LJ Carr for a final conversation as we close the session. Hi. Yes, make some noise, make some noise. Guess who I learned that from? It was you, yes. 
I'm very proud, Harry, to consider you a friend from pretty much the day we met. We both share so much in our compulsion to create, to enhance, to optimize, to augment. So I want to talk about the augmented human a little bit more. I know this is a, a pet subject. Making ourselves better, optimizing for creativity. It led both of us to AI, in fact. So how do you think machines can amplify human creativity further? I think what's really interesting is, obviously I've mentioned this in the session, but uh, intelligence is this exponential ladder mm -hmm. and it almost has like a physics-like quality. It's already out there in the universe and whether it's nature or being a, a human being, we tap into that ladder in different ways. And as I mentioned, the key element for me is game theory is an absolute uh, structure for predicting what will come next. And we're moving into the age of the data set where if people are able to lower their bias, they're able to collect their data, and as tools innovate, you're able to develop these insights and these perspectives that I think are absolutely fundamental. And this isn't actually a technical question. Mm. It's really a social narrative and AI literacy question. Are you going to embrace, and if not, what are the narratives that are often uh, overhangs from science fiction that are in the way? And there are very, very real concerns and consent and power. But as individuals of society, I think it's that, the art of creating a data set, leaning in and embracing. You talked earlier about discomfort as part of the creative process. So I want to talk a bit about this, the discomfort and frustration. How do you even program that? Well, I, I think the, the most interesting thing, and I think everyone in this room, this is the battle that we're facing, is uh, when I first started to work with these systems, um, I think because of my chess background, that's why I lent in. Mm. But all of my peers, all of my contemporaries, and not all to this day, but still some, the discomfort was huge. Mm. I think the, the sense of ownership. And I think it's also a semantics issue. We don't actually have a word for something that is both you and not you. And when something is generative, there's a huge difference between using a large language model, which is holistically collected, mm -hmm. to them uh, using bespoke models and having full consent over the, the creations that you make. And I think that is a, a very different genre which isn't known enough or defined enough in society. I mm -hmm. think this is when things become very exciting, when individuals can feel true ownership from the process end to end. Yes, brilliant. Okay, I'm aware that we don't have tons of time and I want to get into your brain a bit further and talk a little about something that we both feel strongly about in our work with the United Nations and that is accessibility to technology for everyone. So the goal of democratizing this access to tech, how do you think creative AI can have that positive impact on the world? I mean, this is more of a personal story, but I went back to the council estate that I grew up on yeah. and I met a, a lot of the kids there. And the fact that there's an awareness of, of, of even just the most basic tools like ChatGPT, to mm. see that enter in the zeitgeist, especially from when I grew up, there are narratives and stories there which are actually extremely empowering. To have intelligence on tap, mm. to be able to ask questions that maybe you can't ask a parent, to be able to have private discourse, there can be a sadness to that. Mm. But I think, being objective, this is when it becomes very fascinating that you can move into the specifics of a concept in a way that you never could before. The level of intimacy and the higher dimensional focus of being able to question and return on the most nuanced of ideas is of huge value to people that don't have resource. Mm. If you don't have that support, if you're lucky enough to, to have that around you, which is wonderful, there are many that don't. And I don't think this should be replaced, uh, like love and affection should be replaced by the system, but knowledge and intelligence dripping down to every crevice of society, for me that is exciting. Mm. I think it's, it's quite fun, considering that you and I have been working with music and AI for years and suddenly everybody knows about it and wants to ask more about it. So I would like to ask a little bit about the speculation of AI futures. You mentioned earlier about science fiction's kind of the tropes that we see, the end of the world, the rise of the machines. Um, obviously, that's not entirely the case. So where do you think AI will lead us? I think we're moving into the age of beholdment where more and more we are going to see things and, and, and 
feel things that are truly interventional. They really are mutational levels of creativity as opposed to a lot of the regurgatory generative uh, human level creativity that we see. Um, but I, I mean, how has it affected you and, and your practice? I think when I was younger and first sort of interacting with music and technology, like I was tiny and playing with bits of tape or really old computer music things, I was ever so frustrated trying to make, for example, I did a thing where I wanted to listen to the solar system. So I put all the data from the planets into a music sequencer and tried to kind of listen to all of the planets. And really, it sounded rubbish because Jupiter is massive. And every time Jupiter would come round, it would go, and then, and it just, there was no chance to be musical with numbers. And now there's a little bit more kind of knowledge there, but it does feel like machines are still playing catch up with creativity. We have problems with recursion. After 30 seconds or so, generally, music seems to stop moving and making sense. I think machines can't tell a long form story yet. And so there is this space for collaboration that is this gaping hole ready for creativity. And I have a fear that we might get stuck in the sort of blandness of the middle ground that currently the music industry is inhabiting. It's, it's debatable, um, <laughs> but I, I think there is one thing I can guarantee that there is going to be some absolutely stunning art. Oh, yes. And things that we have never seen before. And consent and regulation is key, but maybe spending a time thinking about the beauty and the awe that is around the corner. I think uh, I, I really believe in the human enhancement of the human experience. Mm. And I'm excited as an artist to try and explore that, and I know you are as well. Absolutely, it's all about this enhancement of the artist, and I am really optimistic about the future from a creative perspective. I love the idea that more people can access these tools. Far from this being a technology that takes people away from creativity, I think it has the opportunity to open the door for anyone to create a masterpiece just by thinking about it, and I think that's beautiful. Well, I think that this is the key point, is, um, vision will be the key factor in progression. We're moving into a time where having an idea and having a sentiment will be enough, and that really diversifies the contribution. Mm. Um, and that's something that our grandparents could never have imagined. So I'm very excited to see people that would never have had a chance be able to elevate themselves mm. and to lead and to bring new, more diverse, interesting, fascinating perspectives of intelligence into human culture. And I think that is definitely a gift of the machine. Well, that's a magnificent place to end our chat on stage. Uh, ladies and gentlemen and everybody, please say a gigantic thank you to the inimitable Harry EF. And thank you, audience, for your time and attention as well. Thank you. Shh.